Well, of course, this is arguably the most famous passage from St. Paul's writings, this is chapter 13, of the first letter to the Corinthians. It's, uh, as you, I'm sure you know, it's often read at weddings, since that's all about love, or should be all about love, just like our faith and religion should, should be all about love. But that's what Paul's trying to teach us here. And it's good that he gives us a list also, you know, of you know, what list love consists in. He says, if we have all knowledge, all faith, but don't have love, worth nothing. If you give away all you have and you're don't, not doing it out of love, he says it's worth nothing. Love is pa- this is according to the RSV translation. Love is patient and kind. It is not jealous or boastful. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not seek its own. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in the wrong, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things and believes all things and hopes all things and endures all things. Well, that's quite a, quite a list. But I want to especially focus on that last part of the reading, which we almost didn't have, uh, from uh, saying one of the reasons that love is so important and love is central is because it's the only thing that lasts. I remember when I was a young Jesuit, I was drawing some you know, ruins of columns, you know, the Roman Empire, all the all the fallen civilizations across history, and I wrote, love alone is lasting. And that's what Paul's saying here. Love is the only thing that lasts. And he says our knowledge, our prophecy, our our speaking in tongues, all that is partial. We know it's all partial, probably with both meanings of partial. It's in part, certainly. But love is the only thing that is entire and lasting. We see indistinctly as in a mirror, as mystics always point out, but, and and a mirror in those days was of course polished metal, it's not like we have today. So we did see indistinctly, we always see indistinctly, we only have partial knowledge. We can't trust, you know, our systems and our concepts and, you know, and all of our theologies for that matter, because it's partial. Love is what pierces through to, to the authentic and to what really lasts. That's what he says, and our knowledge is partial now, but then I shall know, even as I am known. Which is heaven, the vision of heaven is, I shall know even as I am known. So in other words, through love. God loves me through love, and that's how I will know God, and myself, and everybody else, through love. As Gregory the Great said many centuries ago, amor ipse notitia est, love itself is knowledge. In fact, it's, it's the deepest knowledge. The only complete knowledge is love. We can only know, as anybody, as you should know, you can only really know people if you love them. You cannot know anybody you don't love. It doesn't go deep enough or far enough. So, these three last, faith, hope, and love, he says, but the greatest of these is love. So love is not partial. It doesn't depend on our concepts of, you know, our political systems or our religious systems or our national, you know, our our racial systems, any other systems. It goes beyond that. And we see that's the, the challenge of love. It's not partial in any either sense of the word, partial. No partiality. It just as loves as God loves, completely and entirely and wholly, the whole person, the whole of reality. Hmm. So prophets who preach this, that's what they basically are preaching, you know, stop forgetting the poor, you know, stop, you know, you know, getting stuck in your own systems, they're never accepted in their own country. Jeremiah is the good example. God is summoning him here in this first chapter of Jeremiah in the first reading today. And God doesn't say, you're going to be, you, people from all the foreign nations and the pagan nations around you are going to fight you. <laughs> That's not what he says. He says, the priests of your own people, the kings and the princes of your own people, your own people are going to fight you because you're not going to be partial. You're going to say things that they don't like, don't fit into their agendas, that don't fit into their worldview. 
which is what happened, of course. He's most, one of the most persecuted of prophets. And towards the very end of his prophetic career, he's, he told you know, the, what turned out to be the last king of Jerusalem, surrender to the Babylonians. <laughs> well, you know how that went over. The priests and the people and the princes and the king said, how dare you, traitor, d d surrender to the, the Babylonians? But that's what, what God was saying to them. And why? Because God didn't want his people to be slaughtered and the, and the city to be destroyed and then the Babylonian exile, which was what happened because they didn't listen. So prophets always go beyond your little systems and your expectations and your little tribalisms. And boy, do we need to get beyond our tribalisms today. Wow. In this country, in this church, tribalism is becoming more and more rigid and hateful. And that's not the gospel. I mean, we say we're Christians or Catholics or whatever, but I guess we forgot the gospel a long time ago. We just follow our traditions and our systems and our political convictions or whatever it might be, and there's nothing to do with the gospel. Well, look, look, look at today's gospel. Jesus comes to his native place. We heard last week he quoted Isaiah I'm here to bring good tidings to the poor. The Lord has anointed me, you know, to bring sight to the blind and release to the captives. I guess the captives don't want to be released and the blind don't want to see because he goes on to do that. And the people who marveled at the gracious things that came from his mouth, as we just heard, five minutes later, were ready in an angry mob to hurl him ac across the cliff and kill him. What happened? He challenged their tribalism. Nothing creates the anger of the mob more than having their tribe threatened, in case you haven't noticed. So look what Jesus did. I mean, look what he's, he quotes. He, he quotes these examples, not even his own treatment. He himself went way beyond the tribalism with Samaritans and tax collectors and sinners and prostitutes and lepers. But here he's quoting examples from the former, from the, from the previous centuries, the former prophets who weren't accepted. And it's pretty shocking. Here you had all these widows in Israel at the time of Elijah when there was a famine, and you'd expect God to come to the aid of all these widows that belonged to his people. But there isn't any his people. All people are his people. However arrogantly we might think that we are his people. And so he says, God didn't send Elijah to any of them, any of them, because he was teaching everybody a lesson. He sent them to a foreigner, a pagan, and, and helped her. And then the second example is even more shocking. He says, in the time of Elisha, there were so many lepers in Israel. God didn't send help to any of them. He helped the Syrian captain of the king that had invaded their country. The foreign invader. He was helped. Not any of the poor people of his, of his own people. What is trying to be said here? God has no tribe. God has no people. We're all his people. God has no partiality. That's exactly the word that's used by St. Peter when God finally convinces him that you should open the doors to the Gentiles too. And who was the Gentile? It's Roman centurion in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10 and 11. The Rome, uh, Roman invader, another invading army, and they're the ones that are helped and called. The lesson couldn't be clearer here. And yet all through history, all through, quotes, Christian history, we've been tribal. Not even fellow Christians, you know, are acceptable sometime. Those Greeks, those Russians, those Protestants, you know. God has no partiality. And he's continually on the side of those whom we reject to show that he does not reject them. That's the way Jesus lived and got in trouble with the same priests and princes and people that Jeremiah did and all the rest of the prophets, and that's where it got him. Most modern prophets end up assassinated also because they challenge the status quo of the tribal mentality that 
characterizes human nature. But if we're called to be children of God, who, as Jesus says, makes his son and, and rain come upon the just and the unjust, the good and the bad, the grateful and the ungrateful, God has no partiality. And neither should we. We shouldn't love in part. Love is what lasts and love is what is all-inclusive. So as Americans or Catholics, we can't be partial. We can't say no to those Mexicans and no to those Muslims and no to those blacks and no to those gays and no to those Protestants and no to, sorry, sorry, doesn't work that way. And it's precisely Christians, usually white Christian nationalists, who are saying, we're the Christians. Well, clearly not. Clearly not. So we really have to challenge our own hearts and our own minds to love everyone in truth of heart, as the opening prayer says, to love everyone the way Jesus does. And with his final commandment, love everyone as I have loved you, embracing the tax collectors and the prostitutes and the sinners and the Samaritans and the pagans. <laughs> How do we miss this? We miss it because we stick with our own tribal instincts and are remain unconverted. And because it's too threatening to open our hearts and minds to everyone. Because then we feel threatened and unprotected and unspecial. Unspecial. What's more special than being a child of God, an imitator of Jesus? Imitating God. What's better than that? But then, of course, your tribesmen, and usually men, your tribesmen will throw you over the cliff. And we don't want that. Well, we need to want that, if that's the price we have to pay. Love is patient and kind, not arrogant, nor rude, etc. The gospel is really, really clear. So let's be really, really clear about who we really, really are in our fundamental identity and who we're really, really called to be. And stop messing around, calling ourselves Christians otherwise.